Good morning. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Um, the weather's changing. Actually, it changed yesterday. Um, we all walked in here early. Those of us that arrived early, we were cold and we were celebrating the, the, the temperatures. And then I checked my phone and it was 57 degrees. I said, that doesn't sound that cold, but it's, it, 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 it's a good change. And so you're probably getting your shopping done. And I, I, I later on today or sometime real soon, I'm going to be in a, in a duck blind again. So it's just that time of year. So um, I bring to you a message that is, it is timely in that it is a Christmas message, uh, but it is also timeless in, in that it transcends this season. It transcends our lifetime. It's a truth that is found in Scripture throughout and that truth is that God has a habit of showing favor to the most unlikely of people. Let me say that again. God has a habit of showing favor to the most unlikely of people, to the most unlikely of characters. You've probably heard that at some point in your life, you probably have never considered that to be a major theme in Scripture, but I, I want you to, to consider today the fact that that is possibly a major theme throughout Scripture, that God favors, He shows His loving kindness toward, He, he draws in and embraces the most unlikely of characters. Two weeks ago, we looked at, at Mary's song, this, this song or this, this poetic utterance that came out of her uh, when she was visited by the angel, when she was told that she was going to give birth to the Christ child, this most likely teenage young lady uh, who was not yet married. Uh, when the angel of the Lord visited her and told her, then this, this prophetic utterance, this song, the Magnificat, um, it, it, it came out of her. And when we looked at it a couple of weeks ago, there was one line that we sort of glossed over, but I want to I wanna pay a little, bit, a little closer attention to today. She says this. She says in Luke chapter 1, verse 52, He, God, he, ha uh, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. That's the English Standard Version, a good solid version. There's another good solid version, the, the NLT, which we're not going to project, but it, it may be a little bit easier to understand. It says... He has, he has brought down the princes and has exalted the humble. Now, now that, that utterance that came, came out of uh, a teenage young lady. Now, certainly God breathed, certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit. But, but those sound like, like deeply socio-political sort of words. Um, she says, God has sent Jesus that, that the princes might be laid low and that the humble might be exalted. Now, now, we should wrestle with that or we should just say, oh, that is so figurative that we can just, just ignore it. Uh, she didn't really mean it that way. Or, or, or we can... We can wrestle with it. And you say, well, I'm glad I'm not a prince, but, but am I humble? I was reading a, uh, a, a Washington, uh, an article out of the Washington Post uh, the other day because I was, I was searching for different, different facts on, on the Magnificat, and I, I ran across something that I really didn't know. Maybe you knew this, but... but, but this line out of the Magnificat, out of Mary's song, which is, which is, which is sung way more in the Catholic Church than it, than it is by us in the Protestant Church, uh, but this one line, 
God has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. It has, it has been historically so controversial that there are like four countries in the last 50 years that have banned that line. Like in, in public, uh, in, in liturgy, in, in church worship, four countries have said, you can't sing that line. You can't use that line. You can't recite that line. So on a, on a, on a, on a public, broader uh, level, um, the, the world we live in, they believe that what Mary just said, number one, she meant it, and number two, it's quite controversial, dare I use the word subversive. Mary says, God is sending Jesus, and what's going to happen here is, is he will bring down the mighty, and he will, he will exalt the humble. You hear this phrase sometimes in the church, I use this sometimes, the, the upside down kingdom of God, which actually for, ter- for, et- for eternity will no longer be upside down. It'll be right side up, and, and the world as we know it will then be upside down, backwards. So we live in the, the kingdom of the world, every one of us, and it gets all over us, and sometimes we, we, we live and breathe and operate according to the kingdom of the world, and all the, all the systems and all the, the value systems that, that this world affords us. But then Jesus comes and he turns that kingdom on its head. And again, it, it's undeniable. You, you can't escape it. it. It even sounds a bit subversive. Again, the main point that I started with is that God has a habit of showing his favor to the most unlikely of characters. Last week, Pastor Billy preached, and, and he, he, he preached uh, Zechariah's song. If you, if, you, if, if you don't know or you don't remember, what we've been doing during this month, the four Sundays of Advent, is we're looking at the different songs in, in Luke. So Mary's song, Zechariah's song. Today, I'll just give you a heads up. We're, we're looking at the song that the angels sang to the shepherds, and the next week I'm going to be preaching on on Simeon's song. Uh, So anyway, two weeks ago, or or last week rather, Billy Billy preached on Zechariah's song, and and so what what we saw is that God, he shows himself to Zechariah. But see, Zechariah, he's a good man, he's, he's a righteous man, he's an older man, he's a religious man, he's a religious leader. It's not that surprising that, that God would show up in, in his life. I mean, you know, as we, just sort of, the, sort of the way that we see religion and the way that we see God, we'd probably say, oh yeah, he showed up to that religious man, in that religious man's life. Of course he did. But that's not my point. Remember, my point is that God shows up in the lives of those unlikely of characters. So, so that was last week. Two weeks ago, I preached on, on Mary and how God uh, showed up um, in Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, and in that case, God shows his favor to a simple, poor, young girl, just old enough to be married. And, and so, yeah, that's surprising. That's surprising, but, but not as surprising as today's story. Again, God has a habit of showing his favor to the most unlikely of characters. Today, we look at the shepherds. God finds favor with the least likely characters imaginable in that Middle Eastern Jewish culture. Now, if you do a deep dive into the, to, to the role or the, 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 the esteem or the the lack of esteem of the, of, the, of the shepherd in the Middle Eastern uh, culture of that day. Uh, it's complex. We're not going to do it. We don't have time to do a deep dive right now. There were different sort of classes of uh, shepherds. If you lived at home and you maybe had some sheep and you might go out, but you were still part of like the town, you weren't, you weren't, you weren't looked down upon quite to the degree uh, 
you weren't considered the lowest of the shepherds, but if you were a wandering shepherd, if you were nomadic, which was 99% of the shepherds of that day, if you, wander, if you, if you found yourself out in the field at night, uh, taking, you know, having watch over, shepherd, uh, over sheep, then you were, you were considered very lowly. Um, shepherds, um, if they were here today in today's worship service, like they, they, they showed up at River Church, which would be kind of weird, but if they showed up at River Church, shepherds with all their garb and their sheep outside, <laughs> that would be real weird. Uh, but if they did, if they did, uh, they, would, they would be like in the back probably, like drinking coffee. They, they may not feel comfortable sitting down. In the, in, the, in the culture and the society of today, um, it might be like if they, if they came in, but they had like a, a rolled up piece of cardboard tucked tightly under their arm, you know, like a, a makeshift bedroll that they would use to sleep at night. I don't know, maybe you're not a shepherd, but maybe you're healed here today and you feel like you don't belong. Or maybe you feel like you have to, like, fake it in order to fit in. But, but, but if, you, if, if you were really, if you were really you, maybe you feel like you wouldn't fit into this religious, pious, maybe even sometimes self-righteous sort of crowd. So maybe you can relate to the shepherds. So 2,000 years ago on the night that Jesus was born, God revealed his favor, his kindness to the most unlikely group of people. And you can either choose to believe that that was random and God didn't know what he was doing, or you can choose to believe that God determined of all the people that he could send the angel ultimately the host of angels too, of all the people that he could have given the news to first, he chose the most unlikely group of people, the social outcasts. Because God has a habit of showing his favor to the most unlikely of characters. Now, if you go home, and I hope you do, if you go home and you study this, the the, the culture and the context of the shepherds in that day, you'll realize that, that it was actually outrageous. Shocking, disgraceful, shameful, appalling, scandalous, whatever word you want to choose. You need to understand that being a shepherd was not impressive. It was not a high status sort of job, being a shepherd. It was not your dream job, but it was rather, rather the job that you might settle for living outside of town, hanging out with animals all day, sleeping on the ground, considered, considered weird or unacceptable by the rest of society. Now, I read what I'm about to tell you. I read this from notes that I had written years ago, and I had to go back and check because I thought, surely that's not true. So I went back, and I, I double-checked my, my sources, and and, 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 and lo and behold, it was true. Get this. Shepherds were so despised, especially nomadic, wandering shepherds, that their testimony wouldn't hold up in court. Like, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth? What? You're a shepherd? Get out of here. You can't be trusted. Get out of here. So when the angels show up to visit the shepherds, that's surprising. The angels had only showed up to Mary, to Joseph, to Zechariah, the the father of John the Baptist. And now God chooses to favor the most unlikely crew of people that he could possibly choose. So, so when the angels show up to visit the shepherds, that's surprising because, get this, no one ever visits the shepherds. (laughs) 
Maybe that's you. Like, no one ever visits me. No one ever visits the shepherds. And only a few hours later, I'm getting ahead of the story here, but only a few hours later, they find themselves in a town looking into the eyes of the promised Messiah, looking right into the face of baby Jesus, looking right at, not a picture of, but right at God who became a man. So God, in the form of the God-man, the Messiah, Jesus, God came on that night. He came on that night humbly, and the religious were not even informed. With all that as the backdrop, let's, let's read this. Luke chapter 2. And she, Mary, she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was, there was no place for Jesus and Mary and Joseph in the inn. All right, so that's the, that's the backdrop. That's just happened. She gives birth, you know, and all that goes along with giving birth there now, there's straw, and there's animals around them, and she's doing her best to keep her baby, uh, sanit- you know, keep, 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 keep this, the place sanitary, and she wraps him up tightly so that he's comfortable, and this is the God-man, this is the Messiah, this is Jesus. Verse 8, we switch scenes geographically, we're now in a different place, and in the same region... There were shepherds, go to verse 8 now, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around, or shone around them, and they were fi- filled with great fear. Take note of that. We're going to come back to that or underline it if you have your Bible or if you're on your phone or just take note of that. They were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will, that will be for, and it says, all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, the shepherds. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's, let's read, let me read verse 14 again. Glory to God in the highest. This is the song the angels sing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So this is the third song. We looked at the Magnificat two weeks ago. That's Mary's song. We looked at um, the, the, uh, the, the Benedictus, the, 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 the blessing, which is uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father. We looked at that song last week, and, and today we look at, at, at the Gloria. These are all the Latin terms for that. The Gloria, and glory to God in the highest, the song that the angels sang um, to the shepherds. Verse 15. When the angels went away from them, uh, from the the shepherds into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And I think they would have stressed those last two words. 
He's made it known to us. They knew they were unlikely characters. Verse 16, and they went in uh, with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. That's a fancy way of saying they told other people. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary, who also heard what the angels, or what, what the shepherds said, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned uh, to the field, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Which, which, what's undeniably stressed in this passage is that the angels, they told the shepherds something. And, and you, you see what it is. They, they, but, but, but what's significant here is that it, it, several times Luke, in his recording of this, this, this chapter of the gospel, he wants to make it clear that the angels told the shepherds. And, and, and then the shepherds were to make the word known. So, so the angels spoke this prophetic word to the shepherds, these unlikely, untrusted, scoundrel sort of, sort of people, these outcasts of society. The angels, under God's um, leadership, the, the angels, they, they could have gone to anybody, but they went to the shepherds, and then, and then the shepherds were to be uh, the proclaimers. So I ask again, do you consider yourself the most unlikely person, perhaps, to be in, here in church today? Maybe, maybe that's how you see yourself. It's like, if you knew me, if people really knew, like you, if you really knew the real me, and you guys would laugh me out of here. Gosh, I hope this isn't the case with River Church, but it is true to some degree with most churches that there's this sense of, like you kind of got to fake it a little bit or you kind of got to be a little more pious, like religious, like, like a do-gooder. Like you, you got to be a little more pious. Um, you got to pretend to be a little more pious than you really are because that's just how church is. And I hope that's not true at all at River Church. But if we're honest, that's, there's an element of that in every church that we've ever been to. And so... If, if that's you, I want to remind you that, that God does not favor the religious. He never has. You have to understand what I mean by the religious, but God, God doesn't favor the religious because the religious most often don't think they need any help. In contrast, the shepherds weren't even welcome in the temple. They were considered unclean. They weren't welcome in the court of law. They, they were considered dishonest. They weren't welcome at the party. They weren't cool. No, no one went to visit the shepherds. They were just their own little group. And that's whom God chose to esteem, to value, to, to favor. The religious, as I've said, they, they often don't think they need any help. But this bunch, bunch of shepherds, they were not too proud to admit, hey, we are not very religious, we need help. Think on this, by the end of, of, of Jesus' life and ministry, 33 years approximately from this night where the, 
the shepherds who weren't very religious, they were visited by the angels. They got to look at Jesus in the eye. 33 years later, by the end of, of, uh, of Jesus' life and ministry, every ruling faction in religion opposed him. As a religious person, that makes me shudder a bit. The, the scribes opposed him to the point of death. The Pharisees opposed him to the point of death. The teachers of the law, which is possibly a third category, they, they, they opposed him to the point of death, his death. God does not favor the religious. But this, this group of shepherds, they, they, they weren't even allowed to be religious because of their jobs. Not welcome in the church because of their jobs. So their attitude, hey, let's go straight to the source. Let's go check out Jesus for ourselves. And this was just the opposite of the response of the religious. We know that, we know that they, had, they had ample uh, information, the religious of that day. They had ample information uh, in, the, in the way of biblical prophecy uh, they had ample information such that they should have known the Messiah is coming, that Jesus is coming, but the religious of that day, they were pious, they were self-righteous, but they missed Jesus. Now in our own piety, in our own self-righteousness, because, I mean, I'll, I'll, be, I'll stand first in line. We tend to be a fairly religious group of people. Pretty, pretty good at keeping rules and, and pretty good at, you know, doing the things that, that I believe are on the list of the, the, the things I'm supposed to do and generally avoiding, you know, the, the stuff on the list of things that I'm not supposed to do. And yet, and yet, here it is, December what is it? The 12th. And I think, you know, just in the last, just this Advent season, have I largely missed Jesus? You know, I know he's there. I know we probably have a little baby Jesus somewhere here. I don't know. But, but have we largely, us, the religious folk, have we largely, you know, just been stressed out about traffic and about about uh, the gifts and Christmas budgeting and like have we largely just missed him? In that day, they completely missed him. The most religious people. I like shepherds. Actually, I don't know any shepherds, but I like, I like their type. I like their type. I spent a fair amount of time around, uh, around uh, ranchers and Guys that that, that, that that handle cattle, and the ones that aren't religious, um, I, I I get them. I understand them. They're like my fishing buddies, the the irreligious fishing buddies that I have. And I like those kind of guys. I would say they're if I, if I brought my fishing buddies. Um, up here on, uh, on the stage right now, they'd be very uncomfortable. Uh, and they'd say, I'm the unlikely kind of person that, that Randy's talking about. I'm the most unlikely person to be at church. I'm not religious. I haven't done much good. In fact, I've done a lot of bad in my life. Um, if, I were, if I were to die tonight, I, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. Or, I mean, look at me. I'm a mess. That's what they'd say. That's what they say to me on my boat all the time. And honestly, that is the message of religion. That is not the gospel. We're going to talk about the story of Jesus, the gospel here in a minute. But that is the message of religion. The message of religion says, if you're a mess, then too bad for you. 
Clean yourself up. There is no hope for you unless you clean yourself up. But, but this is Christmas. This is the Christmas story. And, and it goes like this. In humility, in humility, God becomes one of us. And he becomes our rescuer. God's showing us his favor just because he wants to. The most unlikely of characters. Not because they deserve it. Not because we deserve it. Just because it brings God pleasure. Now what we know though is that it always involves humility. He, 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 throughout Scripture, throughout Old Testament, New Testament, he draws the humble to himself. And, and he, he keeps the proud at arm's length. Is, is what I'm saying today, is it, because, is it because God hates religion? No, it's because God hates pride. which is so intermingled with, with religion so often. God's showing us his favor just because it bl- brings him pleasure to do so. His favor, another word for that, in case you've been wondering what I mean by favor, is his grace. This gift of salvation that we don't earn, that we don't deserve, that it's just favored, grace, gifted, Charis is the Greek word. It's just this gift that he gives us. He favors the humble. Religion is about proud people trying to earn God's love, and that's so tiring, and maybe that's you. And if you're worn out by church and religion today, maybe it's because you're doing it all wrong. The idea of religion is the keeping the rules, um, the, uh, the keeping the, 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 the air of, the, the, of respect by our peers, this sense of being pious. And I've, 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 I've seen, I've read in, in, in several places where Pastor Tim Keller says, Jesus as only an example will crush you. Here's what he means by that. You're never, as hard as you try, ever going to be able to live up to the example that Jesus set for you. And for so many of us, for so many of us, Christianity is mostly about, I'm going to be like Jesus. You know, what would Jesus do? That's a throwback, huh? Like, I'm going to be like Jesus. Guess what? You can't be like Jesus. Are there elements of Jesus saying, teach them to obey all that I've commanded? Are there elements of us striving, uh, looking to Jesus as our example? Absolutely. Sure they are. Sure there are. But as, as Keller says, Jesus as only an example will crush you because you will never be able to live up to it. But Jesus, as a lamb, will save you. What we do is we come under Jesus and and his lordship, and we we receive his his gift, his, his grace, his favor. In humility, we say, I can't do this. I can't live up to this. I can't measure up. I, I don't measure up. I'm, I'm going to quit trying on my own, and I'm going to come under the lordship of Jesus. The, the, whole, the whole of Christianity is about God's undeserved kindness. That's why God sent his angels to the shepherds. And all they had to do, all they had to do is respond. 
get up off the rock, whatever they're sitting on that night, and go see Jesus. And they, they believed, and that's what, that's, that's what God asks of you today, just, just to respond in faith. He doesn't ask you to put on a big show or to be super pious or to, to live up to the example of Jesus, your leader. Going, going back to, to the angel's prayer, um, in verse, in verse uh, 11, in verse 10 and 11, uh, the angels, and, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Fear not. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But then he goes on. He says, verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Read that again. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That one verse would have been a very appropriate way for an angel or anyone else to introduce the birth of a Caesar, a, a, a Roman monarch. Understand, there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, it's no mistake, the angels didn't like overplay their hand. They didn't say more than they meant to say. They announce boldly, knowing that it would be recorded in Scripture, they say, hey, hey, a new king is coming. And he is going to turn upside down the kingdom of this world. I used this word earlier. There, there's a subversive nature to the message of the angels. A new king is born. And he will, he will turn upside down every aspect of culture, politics, religion, everything that you know, everything that you live for, you will either continue to live for the kingdom of this world or you will now live for the kingdom of God. If, if the angels... Um, just so you understand how, how radical this is. If the angels were to come today, they, they would say, if they came today to, to, to us, uh, or to some ranchers in the United States of America, they would say something like, like um, we, we will now pledge allegiance to Jesus and no one else. And we'd be like, wait a minute, that's radical, that's subversive. Because we would know as Americans like what, what that means. I just want you to understand. That's what the angels said that night. In this, this tiny little nation of Israel. Surrounded by this Roman Empire. It says a new king is coming. You would do well to pledge your allegiance. Now. I'll say, I'll say this regarding the fear. If you are not living for, motivated by the gospel, then you are living for, motivated by fear and, and pride. We call it self-preservation. It's no wonder that it's no wonder that the angels said to to uh, to the shepherds, "Fear not." Like, let's start here. Let's start with this. Fear not. Why? Because they knew at the at the lowest sort of the lowest sort of common denominator for the angel for the for the shepherds is self-preservation, just just fear. I'm just you know if you've ever been around like the lowliest of 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 culture. 
of, 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 our, of our border culture. There's just this sense of I, just self-preservation. I just don't want to draw any attention to myself. I just don't want to cause any problems. It's a base level of fear. And so the angel of the Lord starts with fear not. Now let me come back to my statement, and that is that if you are not motivated by living for the gospel, then you today, there's just a low grade of fear. And you may not even choose to admit it to others, but you know inside your own heart. And so we're motivated by the gospel or we're motivated by fear. That's, what, that's what's going on with the, the shepherds right now. The shepherds are struggling like, oh, we've been motivated by fear. But, but God just came and visited us. We just have an invitation to go look at Jesus right in the face. So they're, they're trying to come out from under this culture of fear and be motivated by the gospel. How do we, how do we um, define the gospel? There are, there's only one gospel. We could, it's, but it's so colorful, like a prism, like we can look at it through different lights, and we can say it in different ways. It's the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. It's his saving work on the cross for us. It's all those things. Here's how I want to, this and what I'm about to say is also true. Here's how I want to say it today. The the gospel is the, the imminent, the imminent coming kingdom of the Lord that was ushered in that night by Jesus, by Jesus' birth, and it is continuing, it's, it's, it's imminent, the coming kingdom of God, which one day will totally absorb the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world will be no more. And so this, this imminent, meaning it's, it's inevitable, meaning it's, it's certain the kingdom of the Lord is here and yet not fully here. It's coming. It is coming to fruition. And so if you're still living according to the kingdom of the world, then it's no wonder that we have fear in our hearts. It, it's no wonder that there's just a sense of self-preservation that, that pretty much everyone in culture is living according to. But you are invited to today, as the angels invited the most unlikely of characters, the irreligious shepherds, which you're invited today, it's what they're invited today. Fear not. Go see the Lord, a new king, a new kingdom. No one is too bad for Jesus. It's another Tim Keller quote. It's Tim Keller Day. No one is too bad for Jesus. But a lot of people think they're too good for Jesus. And it's okay for us to admit, like, we're not okay, we're broken, we're fragile, we're dishonest, we can't be trusted, we have a past, we're a mess. Come to Jesus. That's what Jesus is all about. In humility, come to Jesus in humility, and he will show you his favor. Amen. Let's pray.